one really for this year. My name is Annalisa Savaresi and I wear a number of hats, but the most important hat today is that I'm GNHRE Director for Europe and in this capacity I am moderating today's panel. I am really excited to be talking about the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment and the transition, especially at this time, uh, because as you probably know, in the Council of Europe there is a current campaign for the explicit recognition of the right in the regional system, so we thought there couldn't be a better time to convene a panel to discuss this right, its enforcement and justiciability. And we have a most distinguished panel to carry out this conversation. First, we will hear from UN Special Rapporteur David Boyd, who really needs no introduction, given his important work on the right to clean, healthy and sustainable environment, both as an academic first, and then, of course, as Special Rapporteur since 2018. Uh, after David, we give the floor to Judge Veronica Gomez, another most distinguished speaker, who will be uh, addressing us in her capacity of inter-American court judge and providing a perspective from the inter-American human rights system. And finally, of course, two important perspectives from um, Ademola Gede, who is uh, joining us from South Africa, where he runs a center for human and people's rights, and where he has been carrying very important work on the right to a healthy environment in the African system. And last but not least, we will hear from Natalia Kobilars, who is, I'm sure, very well known to many of you for her important work on environmental rights. Natalia works at the Council of Europe and at the European Court of Human Rights, so she's the very best position to provide us an update on where this debate is at at the moment in the Council of Europe. Um, so without further chatter from me, this is how I plan to proceed. I will first give the floor to David and to each of the speaker uh, subsequently, and we will have a 30 minutes Q&A session after all the speakers are done with their talks. I will be enforcing the time limits strictly. The speakers are already well informed about this, so please stick to the time and share slides as you see fit. Um, so without further ado, David, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Annalisa. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with such a great group of colleagues and friends and a huge thanks to the Global Network for Human Rights and the Environment and to the UN Environment Program for this amazing summer winter school program. My friends, it is a very exciting time, as Dina mentioned, for those of us who are proponents of the right to a healthy environment, but it's also a very paradoxical time. It's exciting because of the Human Rights Council resolution in 2021, the General Assembly resolution in 2022, the mainstreaming of this right in international environmental law, such as through the Sharm El Sheikh implementation plan, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, and most recently, General Comment 26 from the Committee of the Rights of the Child, which was the first time that that committee has ever rec recognized that all children have the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. These are amazing jurisprudential developments, but at the same time, we are living in this absolute global environmental emergency, the climate crisis, the collapse of biodiversity, pervasive toxic pollution, water shortages. And so we're, we're really uh, in this paradoxical time when it's absolutely critical that we take the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment, take those beautiful and inspiring words and actually ensure that they are catalysts for transformative action by governments and businesses across this planet so that everyone can actually enjoy their right to a healthy environment. This right is recognized in more than 100 national constitutions. It's recognized by more than 100 countries in environmental legislation. There are more than 130 states that have ratified regional treaties that include the right to a healthy environment. And in total, Canada just recently became the 160th UN member state to recognize the right to a healthy environment in law. And so today we're talking about what are the implications of this recognition, particularly its influence on jurisprudence. Um, when I was doing my PhD many years ago at the University of British Columbia, I looked around the world for court cases on the right to a healthy environment, and I found cases at that time about 15 years ago from 44 countries. 
I'm now working on a project in collaboration with New York University, the UN Environment Program, and the Vance Center for International Justice. We have already gathered cases from more than 70 countries. So, uh, and in some cases, there are hundreds and hundreds of court decisions on the right to a healthy environment from individual countries, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica. You'll notice there's a, a heavy concentration of Latin American countries, but these are, as I said, cases from more than 70 countries around the world. Of course, the actual impact of legal recognition of the right to a healthy environment will depend on a number of different factors in each country and each region. Uh, those factors include legal factors, such as the actual wording of the provisions that recognize the right, whether that's in constitution or legislation or through a treaty, um, the, um, the rule of law in a country, rules regarding standing and access to justice, and then other kind of non-legal factors, such as the pool of prospective litigants, the legal resources available in terms of lawyers trained in this area, civil society organizations, and of course, the broader social, economic, and political context that can have a major influence. But let's turn to the cases now themselves. Time is short, and I'm going to try and really uh, give you a whirlwind world tour of some of the leading cases on the right to a healthy environment. And what's really uh, encouraging is that there are cases, um, this report that I'll be preparing will uh, divide these cases according to both the substantive and procedural elements of the right to a healthy environment that have been developed by courts and legislatures over the past four decades. So these substantive elements include clean air for people to breathe, safe and sufficient water and access to adequate sanitation, healthy and sustainably produced food, non-toxic environments where people can live, work, learn and play, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, and a safe climate. And so in addition to those substantive elements, we have the procedural side where we have access to information, public participation in environmental decision making, and access to justice with effective remedies. And so there are more cases than I could possibly describe in an hour long lecture in each of these specific sub areas. So let me just talk about a few of those cases very briefly. Uh, with respect to clean air, we have amazing court decisions from Argentina, from Indonesia, from South Africa, from Colombia, where courts have said very clearly that clean air the right to breathe clean air is an essential element of the right to a healthy environment. And over the course of the past four decades, courts have articulated a number of specific actions that governments must take in order to fulfill their obligations with respect to clean air. And these seven broad categories include monitoring air quality and the impacts on human health, assessing the sources of air quality. So, you know, in different countries, different regions, uh, different sources are the main contributors. Number three, making sure that that information is conveyed to the public and that there are, for example, daily air quality advisories that are accessible to the public. The fourth thing that governments must do is they must develop air quality legislation, regulations, and standards based on the best available science. So, for example, there's a Chilean case that says in setting air quality standards, the government must be guided by the World Health Organization's air quality guidelines. The fifth step in terms of clean air is that governments must develop action plans with the measures that are necessary to achieve the air quality standards. Uh, the sixth step is obviously implementing and enforcing those standards, which may involve additional capacity building requirements. And then seventh uh, is really assessing progress and evaluating whether the actions that are being taken are sufficient to meet the standards and whether the standards are sufficient to protect public health and ecosystems. And I just want to pause there and say that the World Health Organization in 2021 produced updated air quality guidelines. And so far, not to, to the best of my knowledge, not a single state in the world has it has improved their air quality standards to meet those new World Health Organization guidelines. So I expect we'll, we'll, I expect we'll see some litigation around that in the, in the coming years. Uh, when we turn to clean water, access to clean water and sufficient, uh, sufficient water, we have cases based on the right to a healthy environment where courts have ordered governments to uh, prevent water pollution, to ensure that communities have pri priority in terms of access to water, and 
Of course, there is some overlap between the uh, right to water and right to water and rights to water and sanitation and the right to a healthy environment. But at this point, the right to a healthy environment enjoys much more widespread legal recognition. So it's very important that these cases um, in Argentina, a case involving Cordoba, in the Philippines, a case involving Manila Bay. These are landmark decisions where courts have required governments to take specific actions to clean up water bodies and to provide drinking water to their citizens. With respect to healthy and sustainably produced food, we have cases involving uh, the right to a healthy environment being used to challenge the government's approval of neonicotinoid pesticides, these pesticides that are notorious for killing bees. We have uh, governments, we have, sorry, we have courts ordering governments to take steps to address water pollution from agriculture. Uh, we have a decision from the Supreme Court of Mexico, for example, that denied approval for a massive industrial hog uh, or pig operation that would have polluted the uh, water of a Mayan community. And so those cases, there are, there are again, legions of them. When we turn to the right to a, the, the substantive element of a non-toxic environment where people can live, work, study, and play, then we have some really amazing and groundbreaking cases. One of my favorite cases is the Mendoza decision um, from Argentina, where the Supreme Court of Argentina in 2008 ordered all three levels of government in Argentina to take a number of specific actions to clean up the watershed of the Matanza Riachuelo River in Buenos Aires, Argentina. That court also uh, used the remedy of continuing mandamus and work is ongoing. But to this date, uh, the governments co collectively have spent literally billions of dollars in improving access to safe drinking water, improving wastewater treatment, improving the waste management system, creating a regional public uh, environmental health system, and undoubtedly has improved the quality of lives for millions of people in that region. We also had the decision of a court in Kenya regarding the uh, a very notorious lead smelter, uh, battery recycling and uh, lead facility, um, and that led to a court decision ordering steps to clean up the soil and the water and the air around that facility. The facility has, was also closed down, of course. Um, other major decisions related to non-toxic environments would include the Supreme Court of Chile's decisions in 2018 and again in 2023 regarding the very uh, heavily polluted community of Quin communities of Quintero Puchincaví, and again, ordering the government to take a number of steps to improve environmental quality in that area. When we turn to healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, I'm delighted to report there's a brand new decision of the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court of Costa Rica um, overturning the government's permission regulations that permitted the fishing of hammerhead sharks. Hammerhead sharks are red listed IUCN species and based on the constitutional right to a healthy and ecologically balanced environment, the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court of Costa Rica said that's no, that is not a permissible to continue fishing for those hammerhead sharks. There are many cases, um, cases protecting forests in Ecuador, in the Philippines, in Hungary, where forests have been protected from various harmful activities. Um, there are many cases from around the world where specific endangered species have been protected. And then when we turn to the final substantive category of a safe climate, we have uh, again, and some academics, including Anna, Annalisa and Pau de Vilches, have done fantastic work, which indicates that lawsuits, which are in part based on the right to a healthy environment, uh, and these are climate change lawsuits, actually have a, a, a better chance of succeeding. So you have cases like the PSB case in Brazil, which uh, was based on Article 225 of the Brazilian Constitution finding that the gov Brazilian government's failure to operationalize the climate fund to take steps to address the climate emergency was a violation of the right to a healthy environment. You have the recent decisions in Hawaii, okay. and, Mon Hawaii and Montana, where based on state constitutions that include the right to a healthy environment, in Hawaii, uh, the, the court refused or, or upheld the government's refusal to grant a permit to a biomass power plant in Montana, we had a very recent decision in one of these cases led by youth, uh, where the right to a healthy environment was used to strike down provisions of a Montana law that prevented the government from assessing the climate impacts uh, during permitting processes. So 
that's just really a, a, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the cases that are out there. there the right to a healthy environment has also been instrumental in ensuring that citizens do have access to information, do have the capacity to participate in environmental decision making. And the right to a healthy environment has been instrumental in opening up the doors of courthouses through um, more liberal interpretations of standing. The final two things I want to touch on very quickly are exciting new developments with respect to the right to a healthy environment. The first is that the courts, particularly in Latin America and led by the Inter-American Court, are interpreting the right to a healthy environment, which has been criticized by academics as an anthropocentric right. Courts have been interpreting this right in an ecocentric way. So, for, ex for example, the Inter-American Court, uh, I'm, I don't want to steal Veronica's thunder, but the Inter-American Court Advisory Opinion 23-17, which talked about the right to a healthy environment as also being protective of forests, rivers, and oceans. That concept has been applied by the Supreme Court of Mexico, the Constitutional Court of Colombia, and now the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court of Costa Rica, in cases where those courts have said very clearly that the right to a healthy environment has two fundamental aspects. It protects humans from environmental harms, and it's an autonomous right, so it doesn't rely on any other human rights. And secondly, it protects nature itself, because nature has intrinsic value. And I think these cases are particularly important because they overcome the dichotomy between humans and the environment. We are part of nature. Um, and so that's very exciting. And the second exciting development is a growing number of cases where governments have been able to rely on the right to a healthy environment to defend themselves from lawsuits brought by corporate uh, corporations and industry alliances. So these are, for example, challenges to regulations related to plastic bags, challenges related to the creation of protected areas, challenges related to um, restrictions on types of fishing techniques. And so this is really an important development. The court, uh, courts using the right to a healthy environment as a shield to protect government actions and in a global environmental crisis where we need stronger climate actions and stronger environmental actions of every type, we are going to see more of these corporate challenges. And so the ability of courts to rely on the right to a healthy environment as a shield is a super exciting development. Um, my beeper just went off, I'll stop talking. and I'm really looking forward to my other panelists and also to the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Very many thanks, David, especially for keeping to time. Much appreciated. Uh, I already introduced Veronica Gomez before. She's a judge at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights for those of you who joined after I made my introductions. Veronica, the floor is yours. Many thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Annalise. And um, thank you very much to the organizers uh, of uh, of this course and uh, for having this opportunity to talk to uh, all the people here present with us online. Um, I'm going to share some slides. I, uh, I'm a judge of the Inter-American Court. I work with the Inter-American System. I never take for granted that the institutions of the Inter-American System are known or, or, or understood how how is it that they work. So I think it's important to, to apply a little bit of, uh, of uh, basic knowledge uh, so I'm going to share uh, some slides, and I promise it'll be as the least professorial possible. So um, what I wanted to offer, and, and I think this is what this segment is about, is this international law perspective uh, on the issue of um, the recognition of the right to a clean and safe, uh, clean environment. And uh, this time from the perspective of the inter-American system. And first, uh, just to clarify that we have two interpreters here. One is the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights that is based in Washington, DC. There is a quasi-judicial organ. And the other one is the Inter-American Court of Human Rights that is an international judicial body is based in Costa Rica and it has a contentious jurisdiction, it has an advisory jurisdiction. And uh, it exercises these jurisdictions in a different way uh, from the European Court of Human Rights and this, with some uh, similarities with the African um, uh, 
Human Rights Court. Uh, but um, it's a, in the case of the advisory opinion, is a very, very broad jurisdiction, very different from uh, the one in Europe, a bit more similar uh, to uh, what the ICJ does, but it received requests from um, international organs within the inter-American system and also from states on a variety of, of topics. So that clarified. Um, the other elements I think we need to clarify are which other legal sources of uh, the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as recognized in a progressive way by the inter-American system. And first, um, I want to um, refer you to a very important rule that is more or less the basis of what the inter-American court and the inter-American commission do in terms of development of international law of human rights, which is Article 29 of the American Convention on Human Rights. Uh, and this is a no more interpretation. And although the American Convention on Human Rights does not talk about the right to a uh, uh, clean environment, um, it opens the door to interpretations that include not only the text of this treaty adopted in 1969, but also rights or freedoms recognized in other treaties to which the member states of the OAS or the ones that have accepted the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court are a party to. Now that really opens the field on the interpretations that the Inter-American Court does. And also, more importantly, it opens this very important door to soft law uh, when it speaks about also the interpretation of the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man, a declaration, not a treaty, and other international acts of the same nature. And so um, uh, before the rapporteur was referring to um, the inter-American system and many Latin American countries pushing all of these interpretations, well, these are the doors through which the Inter-American Court of Human Rights can, can move from the text of the American Convention into soft law and into other international obligations of states. And also, and also, if we look at Article 29 uh, with, you know, very carefully, into domestic law interpretations that show that there is a more progressive understanding of the rights uh, protected in the American Convention. And that allows the Inter-American Court to look into decisions of Supreme Court and draw from those interpretations at the moment of in providing its own interpretation of the American Convention and other, other Inter-American treaties. The, the other Inter-American treaty in which we have a clear mention of the right to a healthy environment is the San Salvador Protocol on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, adopted in 1988. And there is a specific provision on the right to live in a healthy environment and to the duties of the state to protect, preserve and improve the environment. Although in principle, this is a non-justiciable right, you cannot bring a a claim before the Inter-American Court on the violation of this right, it provides a basis to establish that there is a legal obligation on the part of states. So this has been very, very important in how the Inter-American Court has interpreted this. And then we bring the other treaties. We have the Escazú Agreement adopted in Costa Rica. Uh, sorry, it says um, 2020, no, it's, it's uh, 2018 and entered into force in 2021 with, uh, at the moment, 15 ratifications. So we're halfway through uh, more or less the states in, in the continent, uh, which is open to ratification. That is very clear in terms of objectives on the obligations of states to ensure access to information to ensure participation in the decision-making process when it has an impact on the environment, 
and also to ensure access to justice. Uh, and also there's a clear mention of the right, not only to, of every person, but also of future generations to live in a healthy environment and a sustainable development. This is a treaty, a human rights treaty, that tries to juggle this false dichotomy as has been labeled uh, by, by the UN Secretary General between development and the protection of the environment on the one hand, and also the protection that is due to human rights defenders working for the environment, which have been targeted, uh, which have been the target of attacks, uh, violent attacks. Um, there is a sad statistic in Latin America of murders of environmental defenders. So um, that has been the focus of this treaty, access to information, protection of defenders of the environment, um, also opening the door to considering people working uh, for environmental rights as human rights defenders and acknowledging uh, the rights of future generations to, to a clean environment. On this basis, the Inter-American Court has issued uh, a number of ju judgments, I would say in the last 20, 25 years, that touch upon the right to a uh, clean environment uh, in connection with uh, cases on indigenous people's rights, uh, in connection with cases on access to information, and as I was saying before, on cases connected with the protection of environmental defenders. There are many of these cases here, there are some uh, mentioned. Um, the, first, the first one, I was Tingi versus Nicaragua, but then many more, Moiwana versus Suriname, Jaqueaxa versus Paraguay, Sawajamaxa versus Paraguay, Saramaca versus Suriname, and many more, uh, more recent ones, for instance, um, La Cajonet involved in Argentina. Um, there is also in, in the in these judgments of the Inter-American Court um, uh, an emphasis on, on what does it mean to protect the activities of human rights defenders and which are the obligations of states in this regard. Mm -hmm. And as mentioned before, uh, through its advisory jurisdiction, the court has the chance uh, to pronounce on the issue of the environment and human rights, advisory opinion 23rd of 2017, um, where there were a number of important definitions in terms of the components of the environment, as mentioned before by the rapporteur, including uh, nature itself, forests, rivers, seas, um, and um, the idea that um, this protection should not be afforded because of the connection of these elements with human life, but that they deserve protection on their own right, in the fundamental definition, and also that the right to a healthy environment is an autonomous right independent from the protection of the right to life and personal integrity as um, traditionally included in human rights treaties and as a right with an individual and a collective dimension. And also an indication of which are the specific obligations of states in, st in terms of doing, not doing, giving, due diligence, etc. So a very important document um, that is used by domestic courts. Uh, we have a, a tool in the inter-American system, which is called conventionality control, that encourages courts and also administrative units within states to take the interpretations of the inter-American court in 
his judgments and in his advisory opinions and apply them at the local level. And uh, this has been, uh, I think, an important parameter for, um, for domestic courts. Sorry, here. And these state's obligations include um, a duty of prevention to regulate, supervise, uh, require approved environmental impact studies, etc. The precautionary principle, the obligation to co cooperate at the international level, and also a number of procedural obligations in terms of access to information, public participation, and access to justice. That later would also be included in the Escasu Treaty. So um, now we're at a very important moment, not only the Inter-American Court, also the ICJ, the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, also the European Court, I'm sure we're going to listen later, has some also pending cases um, in which the international community has brought again the issue uh, of um, the climate crisis, now on those terms. And the court has received a request for an advisory opinion um, this year. It was presented by Chile and by Colombia um, jointly with the purpose of establishing and clarifying the scope of state obligations in individual and collective dimensions to respond to the climate emergency within the framework of human rights law and uh, taking into account the different sort of impacts uh, that the climate crisis has on persons from different regions of the world and especially sub-regions of our continent um, and also in terms of the impact on nature. Uh, the main issues brought by this request include the duties of prevention and guarantee of human rights, um, also the rights of children and future generations, the obligations in terms of consultation of the pop of indigenous populations and the population in general, the issues of access to justice in connection with the climate crisis, uh, and also international cooperation in terms of common duties of states, but also differentiated responsibilities of states of the international community, and also in terms of the impact that the climate crisis is uh, going to have uh, for human mobility in our region and eventually in our planet as well. So these are, let me see, a few elements that I wanted to bring to your attention about the work that has been done in the inter-American system and that is upcoming uh, for uh, 2023 and 2024. The court is still receiving comments in writing. It's, it's extended its deadline to receive comments in writing from um, civil society states and uh, will hold public hearings uh, usually member states of the OAS, all of them, not only the ones that have ratified the American Convention and accepted the court's jurisdiction, like the US and Canada, uh, tend to uh, uh, participate also in public hearings, presenting their views, because they understand that um, it's important uh, to have their voices heard before the Inter-American Court issues uh, these advisory opinions. And I think this one in particular, um, there is uh, much attention uh, on, on the outcome uh, that the court can offer in view of the previous advisory opinion and uh, the individual cases that have been resolved. Uh, and also in view of the obligations um, um, that states have accepted uh, in light of the Escasu Treaty. So uh, now, if I have one more minute, 
uh, not anymore as uh, in my capacity of judge of the Inter-American Court. I think I've done my duty in talking about uh, a few of the elements um, provided by the Inter-American system. I just would like to say that um, I think that um, we're at a crucial point in which um, we need to understand the contours of the paradigm of uh, public international law and international law of human rights. And not only the roles of, of the role of states and state responsibility, the different, uh, uh, the contours of responsibility um, and due diligence, but also understand the role of private actors uh, in uh, in this issue, in the issue of the climate crisis, understand the connections with um, with human rights and uh, and corporations. Um, also, uh, understand better the issue of the right of new generations. And this is an important opportunity because we are confronting an issue that. Uh, although it has uh, an impact on certain communities, a heightened impact on certain communities, um, it affects not only all human beings, but different for all the species, all the species that uh, inhabit um, our planet. And I think that will lead us to um, rethink some of the paradigms uh, that we use to... Uh, apply and understand and interpret international law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. That was a very a, a extremely insightful perspective on the work of inter-American system in this area. Now, uh, we are running a bit off schedule. So Ademola, the floor is yours. Ademola is joining us from South Africa, the University of Benda. Ademola, are you ready? Uh, are you there? Yes, you are. Thank you. Ademola, we cannot hear you. Are you speaking right now? We can see your slides, but we cannot hear you. Now we can hear you. Hmm. I think there's a problem with the quality of the sound or maybe the signal. Hmm. Yeah, I'm speaking. Very badly. You cannot hear me. Now we can. Hello? Now we can. Yes, we can. So for my side. So I want to. And then he's gone. Well, uh, I think we all know there is power issues in South Africa. So this is probably what is causing the problem here. Um, let's give Ademola a couple of minutes to come back. Otherwise, we may have to go to Natalia. I don't see Ademola. Is he still with us? He is back. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Or not. Hello? Yes. Hi, Ademola. We can hear you. Ademola? Yeah, I'm sorry. We, 
cannot I really hear you very well. Ademola? So. We cannot really hear you. Yeah. So, I want to thank you for the opportunity that you have given to be part of this discourse. Ademola, we cannot really hear you. I I'm sorry about to... this. Okay. Hmm. Dina, I don't know what we can do here. Um, I think um, that the power down is affecting his connection. I think what we're going to have to do maybe is go ahead with Natalia and if Adam Muller can't um, join us after that, what I'm going to suggest is that he records a video for us um, that we will make available on the GNH website along with this recording. Many thanks. That sounds like a helpful way forward. I'm so sorry, Ademola. Um, it's really not possible to hear what you're saying. So, with apologies again to Ademola uh, for this unexpected um, technical issue. Natalia Kobirlas is uh, kindly and patiently waiting for her turn here. Uh, Natalia, as I already said, works at the Council of Europe and the European Court of Human Rights, so is ideally positioned to tell us about developments on the right to a healthy environment there. Natalia, please, the floor is yours. Many thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I'm patiently work, waiting because I am very interested uh, and I, I was listening to the other presentations with great interest. I work um, at the European Court of Human Rights. I am the lawyer at the registry there, and uh, I was also seconded to the Inter-American Court. Um, I teach uh, international human rights, so I have some knowledge uh, about the inter about the African system as well, although I was very much looking forward to listening to Adam Ola's presentation as well. So being the last, I designed my presentation to also show you the differences between the three systems and to really explain what's happening now at the Council of Europe and at the European Court of Human Rights. So um, I will share my screen here to tell you, first of all, about the the process, the political process of how it all came to be and to pay uh, due respect to the people behind it. And then the second part of my presentation is going to be a quick look at the draft uh, protocol that we have that is something that is uh, that has been adopted and informally at the very early stages of the whole process. So this is a very preliminary and speculative, but still there is some sort of a text and I would like to uh, take you through some preliminary normative consequences that a possible right to a healthy environment in a protocol could have. So let's start with the basics. Um, the European system of human rights protection, which is now concerned with the possible addition of the right to a healthy environment, consists of two um, sources and two bodies that implement these sources. So first of all, we have the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which implements the European Convention on Human Rights. And differently to the inter-American system and even more differently to the, inter -Af to the African system, sorry, we're only basing ourselves on the European Convention on Human Rights and the additional protocols that have been adopted since the 1950s, so since the moment when the, uh, the whole system started uh, operating. Um, and the European Convention on Human Rights is the, uh, the, the foundation, then is the source of the rights. And then when it comes to the interpretation of these rights, so not really adding new rights, but interpreting, delineating the content of the existing rights, the court will obviously look at the other sources of international law, whether it's hard law or soft law as well, but it's only as a source of inspiration and in interpretation in line with the fundamental principle of the system, which is that of, uh, of dynamic and harmonious interpretation of the European Convention and its protocols with the international corpus juris. So here we have the European Court of Human Rights. We no longer have the commission like in the other two regional systems. And the court hears individual and interstate complaints. What is required 
for the courts to examine the case on the merits is a direct victim. So there is no actio popularis. You need to be personally affected by a human rights harm that you are alleging. The uh, good thing about the system, and this is also another difference with the, uh, the other regional systems, is that the jurisdiction of the European Court is compulsory for all the members of the Council of Europe. We currently have 46 members. Russia, you may remember, was removed from as a member state um, of the Council of Europe. So we now, uh, we no longer um, examine cases that are coming after the date when Russia ceased to be the member. Um, the court issues binding judgments. There is a whole system of implementation of the uh, of the judgments. Another difference with the Inter-American Court, for example, is that it is not the court that supervises the implementation of the judgments, but as by a separate organ of the Council of Europe, which is called the Committee of Ministers. You will hear this name later on in my presentation. The court can also uh, issue binding interim measures. However, these have never been used in any case with environmental element. And then across the street from the court in the same city of Strasbourg, we have the European Committee of Social rights, which implements uh, and monitors the implementation of the European Social Charter. So the European Social Charter, as the name indicates, is more concerned with those uh, social rights, uh, economic rights, if you wish, not cultural rights. So we cannot really have a division between first generation and second generation of rights. But yes, it's true to say that the European Convention on Human Rights is concerned with civil and political rights. Uh, only uh, right to property as well that can be uh, can be also uh, categorized as such. And the European Social Charter is concerned with those rights that pertain to working conditions, to to those uh, employment issues, and also. Now, you will see in a moment how it relates to the right to a healthy environment. Here we have a system of collective complaints, among other possibilities. There is axio popularis in this system, meaning that uh, certain NGOs and trade unions, for example, they can bring cases, and those have to be uh, addressing a general issue, so no, no, no direct personal individual victims are coming um, before this, this organ. The procedure, however, is optional. And uh, especially um, uh, the, the, this procedure is optional and the, the, there is only a scarce number of ratifications, 12 currently. The committee issues non-binding decision. It can also issue interim measures. So we see the difference of the power, if you wish, and the teeth that are attached to the, to the two systems. Now, what about the right to a healthy environment? The European Convention on Human Rights or its protocols does not contain any right to a healthy environment or anything that would be similar to it. It contains a right to life. It contains the right to respect for private and family life and for home and many other rights. And especially that right to respect for private life and for home, it's Article 8 of the European Convention, has been used uh, in many, many cases, countless cases, uh, with uh, those environmental elements. Overall, the court and earlier the commission have ruled in over 300 cases, which more, more or less directly concern environmental issues. But the court in its, juris, in, the, in its jurisprudence has always stressed that the general protection of the environment does not come within the scope of either Article 8 or any other of the rights, and that other organs and other um, institutions and other types of mechanisms are better suited to provide this uh, general environmental protection. So the court is sort of, in spite of itself, has been issuing judgments, finding violations in cases concerning people living in front of factories or people affected by, by toxic uh, emissions and noise and other issues, clean uh, uh, toxic air, uh, uh, contaminated water, but always repeating that this does not amount to the general protection of the environment or indeed the right to a healthy environment. Two main cases that you might have heard of is Lopez Ostra versus Spain, in which in 94, the court has found for the first time a violation precisely in a situation of somebody uh, specifically impacted by the contaminated air and water emitted by tanneries. And then Kirtatos versus Greece, which is a case in which uh, 
a person did not obtain um, a redress and satisfaction from the court. It was somebody living next to an ecosystem which was damaged, and the court infamously rejected uh, the arguments of the applicants, saying precisely that we're not concerned with the protection of wilderness or peaceful environment. On the other side of the street, like I said, the European Committee of Social Rights uh, had a different approach. In a Greek case uh, that I'm citing here concerning the um, pollution uh, and the, the uh, through uh, because of the use of lignite coal, the uh, committee declared famously that it's Article 11, which guarantees the right to health, includes the right to a healthy environment. But there were not many decisions that followed. There was another Greek case afterwards. And like I said, because this is an optional procedure and uh, it's, a, it's a particular context still linked to uh, the right to health, there was nothing really more to add to this situation. It is important to keep those two uh, mechanisms in mind uh, to understand better the whole political process that is happening. So what happened is we are here now with the Council of Europe based in, in Strasbourg. The Council of Europe, think about it, is uh, the regional European United Nations, like I said, 46 member states. And in 2020, three countries, uh, Georgia, Greece and Germany, come up with a joint declaration on the uh, recommending the need to uh, come up with a non-binding instrument on the right to a healthy environment. Then uh, uh, several other countries declare that the protection of the environment is their priority. But then uh, you may remember uh, the pandemic happened and other priorities became more important. But a person um, who was the president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, so a sort of a body that initiate, uh, initiates legislative changes and reforms within the Council of Europe, Mr. Rick Dams from Belgium, um, a very charismatic person, brings the right to a healthy environment uh, back to the agenda and campaigns for this time the um, binding instrument. The proposal lands with the Committee on Social Affairs, Health and Sustainable Development. Rick Dams is joined by Simon Moutquin, also a, a politician for, from Belgium. He's in charge of writing a report, and indeed he, he submits a report anchoring the right to a healthy environment, the need for enhanced action by the Council of Europe, in which in September of 2021, so before the General Assembly's resolution. Um, there is a resolution that is adopted and a recommendation which both um, contain the recommendation of uh, of uh, uh, of a bind of of. Uh, bringing the right to a healthy environment into this European system. The campaign was called Environment Right Now, and the date of 29th September is important, not only because of that report and those resolutions concerning the anchoring of the right to a healthy environment, but as you can see here, on that date, there was a several a series of different reports that were adopted concerning climate and migration, um, addressing issues of criminal and civil liability in the context of, of climate change, procedural rights, and uh, various aspects of environmental protection. So let's have a quick look at this recommendation uh, that comes from the Parliamentary Assembly under the slogan of environment right now. Essentially, this is a proposal to either adopt an additional protocol to the European Convention on Human Rights, so a source of, of law for the European Court, or additional protocol to the social charter, so a new source of law for the European Committee of Social Rights, or a convention on environmental threats and technological hazards, so sort of an, an overcompassing convention. Um, and so it's not uh, exclusive. It can be all of these instruments can be adopted or only one of these instruments. So the two first instruments, the protocols, would, would have binding force, whereas the convention would be something to which the member states of the Council of Europe would be free to adhere. Uh, and there wouldn't necessarily be, it wouldn't be attached to the existing mechanisms. However, the convention could create a new mechanism. Now, 
the process continues and it goes to the committee of ministers. Remember, I mentioned that name. So this is a body that continues, that has to validate the proposals of the parliamentary assembly in order for them to really become the law. So this poll campaign of anchoring the right lands now with a steering committee for human rights. And you can see here in the right hand column, the whole list of meetings. So the committee has been really busy. And last year they held a a consultation with uh, different experts. You can see the name of uh, Professor John Knox, the previous uh, special rapporteur um, for, uh, for human rights and, and the environment, former judge of the, of the uh, European Court of Human Rights, professors, politicians. There was another conference earlier this year where also representatives of youth, NGOs, coalition of NGOs has a seat uh, during the, 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 um, the, the consultations and the deliberations on the, on the report. And they vote, um, it's the committee of ministers uh, last year, they reply to the recommendation of the parliamentary assembly, they pick up uh, this work and they issue the recommendation on human rights and the protection of the environment. Notice the change of the title. So from the un anchoring the rights to a healthy environment, it's more general and more ambiguous, human rights and the protection of environment. So basically the recommendation now of the committee of ministers dilutes a little bit the force of the language that was uh, within the, in the um, uh, parliamentary assembly's uh, texts. And it uh, recommends to the governments of member states to reflect on the nature, to actively consider recognition of the right to a healthy environment in their domestic systems, to review the national legislation. However, the ongoing work is really now on the feasibility and necessity report of, the, of having the adoption of the right to a healthy environment into the system. And if you consult the website of the Steering Committee for Human Rights and uh, this if you Google up CDDH and environment, it will take you to the draft, which is now the sixth uh, version of the draft. And you can read now the first three chapters of the draft and see really how this whole process is ongoing and how it is all balanced, the pros and cons and which really a uh, recommendation is going to uh, pick up on. Now, this is not without criticism. The main, uh, um, I suppose, issue is whether or not adding the right to a healthy environment would be redundant in the context of the two systems that I described to you, the European Convention on Human Rights, which, de which declares that it doesn't provide the right to a healthy environment, but yet issues judgments concerning certain aspects of environmental protection, and then social charter, which has its Article 11, that includes the right to a healthy environment. Historically now, we've had five um, uh, attempts to bring the right to healthy environment into the system. Uh, those in the 70s, they're more anecdotal, but from 99 to 2009, those were really implemented by the uh, Parliamentary Assembly. And where the end, the outcome was the Committee of Ministers at the end of the day, not recommending the adoption of the uh, instrument with the right to a healthy environment, considering precisely that the environmental protection is sufficiently covered now, not only by the uh, European Convention, but also other conventions and other instruments that operate within the Council of Europe, such as the Biodiversity Convention with, with its uh, uh, complaint mechanism, Landscape Convention and other uh, instruments of that sort. But now this is not the end of the story, because um, in uh, May of this year, there was a uh, heads of state and government summit of the Council of Europe. This is something that does not happen very often. And the, the outcome of that summit in Reykjavik was a declaration in which in its annex uh, number four or five, if I remember, so the last annex, the uh, member states do commit to strengthening of the work of the Council of Europe in the sphere of the environment. But if you look at point two here, again, reflect on the nature, content, and implications of the right to a healthy environment. So there was no, it's not the same language as that that came from the United Nations Human Rights Council or General Assembly. Here, it's more reflect on the nature, possibly implement, encourage the state to, uh, to consider that right. So we'll see what happens really with this, the, 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 the latest, the, the, the next meeting is really in two weeks. Um, and this uh, draft report will be uh, continued. So we'll see what comes out of that. 
But let's have a look now uh, before I finish really at the content of the recommendation from the parliamentary assembly. Like I said, this was something that was officially adopted, but this is not a document that is strictly speaking binding for now the committee of ministers. Still, it gives us some sort of an idea and framework of reference. So in the appendix to the recommendation, there was a proposed text and attention of additional protocol to the European Convention. So the focus is seemed to be on that instrument. And you can see here that there is a definition, the right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. The adjective safe has been dropped in the meantime, so we will not see it in the report. And then the sort of explanation, the definition that it means to live in a non-degraded, viable, and decent environment that is conducive uh, to health, development, and well-being. And notice that the right is described as that of future of current and future generations then we have um, the uh, principles of transgeneration transgeneration responsibility equity solidarity precaution non-regression even in dubia pro natura which are a framework uh, that uh, that um, uh, governs the extraction of natural resources and management of of these resources uh, then uh, what is interesting to point out is uh, that in other paragraphs of that annex, we have provisions that uh, render, that, that present the right as not an absolute right. So the right that is similar to many other rights that exist in the European Convention currently. So restrictions are possible, but they have to be lawful. They have to be necessary in a democratic society in pursuit of a particular general legitimate aim. What is So this is similar to many articles. Like I said, what is different is in Article uh, 8 here and 9 that you see below, uh, the text actually envisages that there is no derogation from the right to a healthy environment, which is something that goes much further than the other rights. The Article 8, the right to, to respect for private life and family life and for home that I mentioned earlier, that is the most commonly used to address environmental aspects, uh, is derogable. So uh, in terms of emergency, in terms of war, states can derogate from, from uh, the implementation of their right. What is interesting, and this is sort of in line in continuity to what David Boyd said and also uh, Judge Gomez from the Inter-American part, is that clearly the proposal, uh, the appendix, but also the resolution and the preamble of the, of the relevant texts, they indicate that th that shift, that famous paradigm shift that, uh, that is occurring. So in other words, in a Quite a timid language, let's say, although still, if you have a look at um, paragraph six here, we talk about intrinsic value of nature, of ecosystems. We talk about um, um, uh, uh, the principle in dubia pro natura. So actually we talk about uh, uh, not only human, but also animal and plant health that is of concern. We we'll talk about biodiversity as such. So all this language really indicates that the proposal from uh, the Parliamentary Assembly is to consider this other dimension of the right to a healthy environment, namely the e objective ecocentric one. And, and this and is Natalia. Natalia, sorry, you, we need to wrap up. Yes, so, this is my last slide. Thank this is you. my last slide, really. So I'm a, I'm about to finish. Just uh, what consequences does it have for the system? Is this is a little bit people say squaring of of the circle. Um, the, the circle being this eco ecosystemic approach, uh, ecocentric approach rather. Uh, so. Um, this is something new for the court, really, to deal with the objective perspective of a right. Rights under the European Convention of Human Rights, they are they pertain to people and they are assessed subjectively. This is a new area, a new exercise for the European Court, and uh, it's um, it receives criticism for some of the of the stakeholders. Um, it doesn't exclude, having the right would not exclude having collateral violations of other rights. The, for example, La Cajonhat case against Argentina shows us that you can have other rights, those more traditional rights that are involved. But what is important is that environment would be sui generis subject matter for the court, and that as a protected right, it would be on equal footing with other rights that are already protecting. And this is important for the balancing of, uh, of the conflict between different rights. Then it is possible to have a minimum severity threshold attached to the right. 
um, uh, the uh, experts that uh, have been have spoken about the right, they pointed to the importance of relying on technical assessments, on the science uh, in, in assessing really the whether the degradation and harm to the environment reached the necessary minimum threshold for the courts to actually take uh, the examination, take up the examination of the case. There may be um, a special regime that will be created that may be necessary. I'm putting question marks here because this is speculation. So perhaps NGOs, environmental NGOs, will need to have a default legal standing in order to argue those objective elements of cases. Perhaps new uh, criteria attached to uh, taking into consideration the diffuse aspects, the, uh, the preventive and slow onset nature of certain aspects of the environment. Um, there is an ambiguity as to future generations in the current texts. There was, on the one hand, proposal to have an ombudsperson for future generations. On the other hand, the way it's framed right now, it doesn't seem that future generations ha are an, a subject of protection as such. And then finally, participatory rights, perhaps new special regime for environment human rights defenders, maybe envisaged a new legal standing not only for NGOs but also for individuals that will definitely that would provide uniformization of standards of fair hearing for the court it would enable um, overall the conclusion i suppose is that the on the on the pro side they having the right would release tensions that are now created because truly the European Court is exploring the limits of the European Convention on Human Rights. And on the other hand, the, on the con side, is that squaring the circle may turn out to be too difficult and dangerous to the current system. Uh, watch this space, really, because uh, in two weeks, on the 27th of September, we will have a hearing in uh, climate change cases uh, before the court, before the court's grand chamber. And these cases and other cases that are currently pending will really show whether or not the European Court has reached its limits of interpretation of the current sources of law and perhaps that the only change and the only progress may be made through this political process that it's currently ongoing. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks, Natalia. It was fascinating to hear the interesting insights on this important ongoing process at the Council of Europe. So many thanks for sharing generously. I have selected some questions that were posted for our speakers in the chat. Uh, David has kindly already uh, answered some of them, but I will start with the first for, by Gregor. Um, I assume you can all see my slides and I'm posting them here so that you can all read them because the chat is a bit small. So what is the structural difference in the scope of protection between the rights of nature and the right to a healthy environment? Um, who wants to take that question? I can see Natalia is eager to answer. I'm eager to answer, but I didn't mean to to go ahead of anyone else. Um, but um, this is something that is a, a contentious issue uh, in this current process that is ongoing. And there was a lot of misunderstanding that had to be explained to the experts that are drafting the report. Uh, and there is a, a confusion and sort of a link necessary link that has been uh, wrongfully, erroneously created between ecocentrism and rights of nature. And uh, we have looked at Argentinian juris uh, jurisprudence, for example, and other states. Here, this is uh, from the European perspective, the proposal of this ecocentric uh, angle uh, attached to the European right, uh, to the uh, to the right to a healthy environment, does not mean rights of nature. So nobody's talking about rights of nature approach here. Animals have not been marked or flagged as as the subjects of rights, they will be object of a right because obviously they make part of, they are part an element of the environment. But um, rights of nature approach is not something that in Europe is well understood or well well uh, received. Uh, we have uh, one example from Spain uh, of um, of the law. Um, that has accorded um, legal personhood to uh, to a sea, to a bay. But as I understand, it is now contested before the Constitutional Court in Spain. So um, this is something that has been separated here in the European context. Anything else that you want to add, maybe David or Veronica? 
Yeah, perhaps Veronica first. Okay. Um, uh, 2003, does it mean OC 17? I assume so. I reported what uh, okay, I Okay, okay. 2003, 203. Um, look, uh, I'm in a difficult position to speak here because we're, we're, we are at portes of, uh, number one, I wasn't uh, part of the composition that issued that advisory opinion, and we're at portes of uh, issuing another one. So I don't think that I should uh, uh, give, um, I cannot provide a direct answer you know, without putting myself in a difficult position as, as judge of the court. Um, I'm just going to, if, if if time allows, just make a general consideration about this. And I'm sorry that I'm moving away from um, sort of um, strictly, um, uh, let's say, um, strict reading of, of texts of um, international obligations but just going to the object and purpose and the historical contexts of those obligations. Um, so because the law after all is just a tool. And so we need to see the big picture. So I'm removing myself from the legal interpretation of the instruments and I'm trying to turn into a historian and say that uh, when you see all of these interpretations coming from Latin America, from the Americas in general, because I'm sure that David as a Canadian feels with me. Uh, we live in the in the continent um, of uh, extraction. It's been the case since the continent was discovered by um, by Europeans, you know, in the 15th by the end of the 15th century. So it's been a process of extraction from that very moment with the use of different technologies. So we've been marked by that. That produced genocides. Lots of indigenous people died. Some of our species were um, exported, like the potatoes and tomatoes that you eat in Europe that come from what today is Peru. Uh, and also our metals. And now we, it's also the region that has the most drinkable water, you know. So now we're also um, facing that prospect in the future. So um, we are confronted, we've been confronted with these issues for centuries. So this, is, and this is very, very close to uh, then our legal conflicts, our political conflicts, our cultural conflicts. This is something with, it's very, very important to understand. And uh, more and more also, something that I didn't mention, uh, we need to use science also uh, as a cornerstone of trust in the reading of the law and the understanding of the law. And we understand more and more the relationship between the health of the soil, the health of the bodies of water, and the health of the air we breathe. So here their issues are much bigger than what was written 50 years ago, 40 years ago in a piece of paper. Uh, and um, I think it's very important to, I'm not talking about the interpretation of the coming advisory opinion, but to read our obligations in context of what is at stake here and what is the very limited role of the law and of strict readings of the law in light of what we know now with science, you know, as a reference, and the long view of history. Sorry about the very interesting answer. Well, that was such a super interesting answer. And I'll, I'll, I'll have, I'll go back to the legal side of things in response to Gregor's question, because we have 
160 countries where we have the right to a healthy environment recognized in law. So we have a huge body of legislation and jurisprudence with which we can answer your question on the right to a healthy environment side. With respect to the rights of nature, although this is an ancient idea from indigenous legal systems and indigenous cultures, the reality is it's only recognized at the national level in about a dozen countries around the world. And there are far, far fewer court decisions interpreting those legal provisions. And so it's very difficult to answer that question in a, in a constructive way because the, the rights of nature body of jurisprudence is much less developed than the right to a healthy environment jurisprudence, if that's, if that's any assistance. Many thanks, everyone. Uh, and I can see Ademola is now back with us. So I thought I'd give him the floor. Apologies again, Ademola, for the connectivity issues. Can you hear us now? Are you able to speak with us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, thanks so much for the... Thanks for allowing me. I'm going to shorten because I know we are not doing good for time. I just want to share some perspectives in relation to the African human rights system. You know, when it comes to Africa, Africa is never lacking when it comes to normative standard. The problem has always been something else. So we have instruments that speaks to environment. We have a lot of them at the African regional level. We have the African Charter, the protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the Rights of Women in Africa which is otherwise called Maputo Protocol. There is also the Kampala Convention, which specifically deals with the situation of internally displaced persons. Then we have the revised African Convention on the, on the conservation of nature and natural resources. And of course, we also have the African Charter on the rights and welfare of the child. But these instruments are so important because they, in a way, provide for substantive uh, right relating to, to the environment. And these are instruments that, that are also widely ratified by, by state parties. We have the African Charter that has been ratified by I think 54 African states. Only one state has not, uh, it's not a state party to the charter. We have, the 50, we have about 53 states who, are ratif who have ratified the Children Convention. And of course, 44 are ratified by Maputo Protocol. Now, I don't want to, some of the provisions that relates to the environment in, in these uh, instruments, so widely ratified at the African regional level, Article 24 of the African Charter. We have the Article 18 of the Maputo Protocol, which speaks to the right to healthy and sustainable environment. Then we have also Kampala Convention, Article 92J and Article 103, which also talk about situations relating to displacement in, in, the, in the context of uh, projects. And in, so, in making such provisions, it does make reference to environmental induced uh, displacement. Now, we also at the African regional level has uh, the conservation pro convention, which extensively makes provision for procedural rights. It's, it's like, like the house convention that is applicable in Europe. So we have these provisions within the conservation convention, which provides for procedural rights, such as the access to information, public participation, need for environmental impact assessment, access to justice, among other procedural rights at the regional level. Now I then the of course the charter to relating to the children have specific provisions relating to the environment. Now there is no it's not clearly stated there, but then the preamble of the children charter does say that the African human the African human and people's rights charter applies, and because it applies, one can see directly that every child also has a right to help the environment at least at that continental level, based on the provision of the African Charter. Of course, Article 11.2G, which also talks about uh, the, the education of a child in the context of respect for environment. 
So I just want to, because we're not doing well for time, these are the, I would have really loved to take us through the procedures and how to access, you know, all the complaint mechanism that we have at that level, but time will not permit me. But just to say that the, for the, for the commission, it has its procedure, then the court also has direct and indirect way of accessing it. Now, uh, you, let me just talk about the jurisprudence, which has emerged from the from the continental level. Uh, now, there's no way we can talk about the jurisprudence at that level without making reference to the Ogoniland case. And uh, you know, Ogoniland case is a case involving the uh, depreciation of the environment carried out by the you know uh, non-state actors, particularly you know Chevron, in, in complicit with the state. Uh, uh, state uh, petroleum uh, corporations, uh, that uh, activities there had really led to uh, the lapidation of the environment in the Niger Delta in the, in, in the state of Nigeria. So uh, the commission had an opportunity to look at this case and did come up with uh, some uh, conclusion in relation to what is happening there. In that case, uh, in finding that Article 24 of the Charter was has been violated. The court uh, make reference to the need, importance of you know safe environment within the context of Africa, and of course the need to ensure that you know that the uh, government takes adequate step to ensure that uh, uh, environment, right to early environment, is guaranteed, particularly for the people in Ugunela. Now we also have other. Uh, development within the sub-regional level. And this sub-regional development are so crucial because uh, there are certain provisions within the uh, within the AU level, which allows for, you know, interchange and interreferences in terms of, you know, uh, drawing inspiration from one another. Article 61 allows the, uh, allows the commission to do that. Article 8 of the um, Rules of Procedure of the African Court also allows the Court of Human and People's Rights to do that. And so does Article 48 of the African Child on the Right and Welfare of the Child. So we see on a number of occasions at the sub regional level, references being made to cases and of course to the provisions of the instrument at the EU level in determining cases relating to uh, protection of environment. Examples of these are replete, and of course, Nigeria features a lot, even in in, uh, in, in those contexts, like we have with the uh, case decided by ECOWAS, Serap versus Nigeria, which again, the court used to draw the attention of uh, government on the need to respect the rights of, to early environment of the of the Niger Delta uh, people who occupy the uh, South uh, South South State in South, South, South Southern part of Nigeria. So we also have at the at the at the at the east at the Eastern African level the case of uh, African Network for Animal Welfare versus the Attorney General of the United Republic of Tanzania. So we see in this case too that you know that the case also feature uh, issues relating to. Uh, the environment within the context of development. See so the court coming to, uh, uh, up with the, with, with the finding that the failure of states to take measures to, to ensure that the environment is protected in its pursuit of development is a violation of you know, uh, provision relating to right to health the environment. So th those are some of the development there. And we also have um, the commission as well as the court recognizing the right to health environment in an indirect way, particularly in a number of cases. One of them is an intercommunication between the state of DRC uh, against uh, Burundi, Rwanda, and Ghana in relation to the activities of the military personnel of those countries in DRC. So uh, issues of environment feature prominently in that case and the court uh, did not hesitate to find a violation of uh, articles, particularly relating to right to development. That case did not specifically detail to the environment, but 
but indirectly it implicates the, the commission took into consideration circumstances around the environment to come up with this finding. And we have similar approach followed in the case, in the Andrews case, as well as the OGS case. Now implementation, the, 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 in talking about implementation, all these uh, complete mechanisms are put in place, certain uh, rules to allow for implementation. Look at article, article one of the African Charter, particularly, you know, talks about uh, the need for member states to ensure that, you know, uh, they, they, they comply with the, they, call, they take measures to fulfill the freedom guaranteed in the, in the African Charter. And a similar obligation is also imposed in Article 1.1. So these are, uh, these are instruments which fund or which support the, the idea of enforcement of you know, whatever decisions that these complaint mechanisms are, are come up with. And this has been followed by the rules of procedure. Through 2125, for instance, talks about enforcement and compliance uh, with the decisions of the commission, and so does the uh, so does the African Committee of Experts on Right to Right and Welfare of the Child, in terms of the rules governing its operation, which are talk, which are, does recognize the role for. A working group, for instance, to ensure that is the implementation of the decision of that body. But despite all this provision, one can see in a way that you know states have not been always enthusiastic about implementing, you know, this body's decision. There are there in the Gunila case decision, for instance, is it's been more than two decades since uh, is a. Uh, the decision was given, but you know, in terms of compliance, it has not been so impressive. There have been little steps here and there taken by government to ensure some compliance with some aspects of the decision. But, but all in all, one cannot say there is complete uh, compliance with those decisions. So uh, that is all I have to say because of the time. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, Demola, for joining us. And indeed, apologies again for the te technical issues you have experienced. Uh, I am sure that everybody would be very grateful if we could benefit from viewing the slide deck that you had to present so quickly. If you make it available, I'm sure we find a way to make it uh, available together with the recording of this session. Some of you have asked, is this session recorded? It was. So it will be available on the GNHRE webpage. There were many more questions in the chat, but I am mindful of time because our speakers have been so generous and I know they probably have to be elsewhere. So I think that uh, those of you whose questions we did not manage to answer, especially Diana, who asked an important question on environmental defenders in Europe, please feel free to approach me approach of our colleagues and we are very happy to answer your questions. But I think for now, what I'll do is thank very much our speakers and especially Ademola for being so patient. Thank you so much for being with us in this session. And I look forward to the next. Thank you so much for joining us.